Many substances can move in and out of cells without the cell having to expend any energy at all. This type of movement is termed passive transport. Molecules in this case move in response to a concentration gradient. Simple diffusion is our first example of passive transport. It's the movement of molecules from high concentration to low concentration across a semi-permeable membrane. It's a form of passive transport, so it requires no energy, and it'll continue until the concentration is in the same in the cell as it is in regions outside the cell. So when you think of diffusion in general, let's say I sprayed some stinky perfume in one corner of the room, it would take a certain amount of time for the molecules to distribute themselves evenly throughout the room and everyone could smell this stinky perfume. When a membrane is permeable to a molecule, it'll simply diffuse right through the membrane. And this is why we call it simple. It doesn't need any help at all. However, as we've already explored, biological membranes have phospholipid bilayer and a very hydrophobic interior that repels polar molecules, but not nonpolar molecules. So any polar molecules have very little chance of making it through that phospholipid bilayer without any help. Nonpolar molecules will move until the concentration on both sides is equal because they can easily slip between this phospholipid bilayer and brave this hydrophobic region in the middle. After all, they're nonpolar and thus they're hydrophobic themselves. That means the membrane has limited permeability to small polar molecules and very limited permeability to large polar molecules and ions. However, it will have permeability to those molecules that are nonpolar and can slip between the phospholipids in the phospholipid bilayer. Now, those that are too large or too polar to pass through the phospholipid bilayer need to be facilitated. That is, they need to be helped out. Facilitated diffusion is when we have molecules that cannot cross the membrane easily. Thus, we put things like pores in place or channel proteins, and these molecules can then pass through the channel proteins. Channel proteins specifically are hydrophilic channels when they're open, so very similar to the pores we looked at in the previous presentation. Carrier proteins, however, bind specifically to the molecules that they assist. So channel proteins are channels that are open, they're hydrophilic through the center, so ions and polar molecules can pass straight through the channel, whereas carrier proteins are much more specific and they won't open until the specific molecule that they assist binds to them. It's these protein channels that make the membrane selectively permeable. The cell can place as many or as few channel proteins out in its membrane as it needs to allow substances to pass into and out of the cell through the selectively permeable membrane. Channel proteins mainly come in the form of ion channels. They allow the passage of ions. Sometimes they are gated, which means they open and close in response to a stimulus, that is, a chemical or electrical stimulus that says, hey, we need to let this ion in, let's open the gate. A classic example of this is the action potential of a neuron. When the signal tells the neuron to fire, the sodium gates open and sodium rushes into the cell. These are electrically gated channels. Three conditions will determine the direction of movement across ion channels. The relative concentration on either side of the membrane. So if there's a lot of substance outside, then it will move down its concentration gradient into the cell. But if there's a lot of substance on the inside, it will move down its concentration gradient again to the outside of the cell. So you can see some familiarity here. It's still passive because we're going down the concentration gradient as opposed to against it.
there could be voltage differences across the membrane. When we consider the transport of ions, some things are positive and some things are negative. And we'll see as we learn more that there is a voltage difference across any cell membrane. And if that voltage difference becomes enough, then ions will move across the membrane. For example, negative charges are attracted towards positive. In addition, some of the channels will be gated, so if the gates open, we can let substances pass through. But if the gates closed, sorry, nothing's going to pass through. When we consider carrier proteins, they can help transport both ions and other solutes, such as some larger molecules like sugars and amino acids. Again, because we're looking at passive transport mechanisms, we require a concentration difference across the membrane so that the molecule can move down its concentration gradient from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. In the case of carrier proteins, the molecule that's being transported must bind to the carrier protein. And in such a fashion, the carrier protein moves one molecule at a time across the membrane. We can only transport as much material as the number of carrier proteins can tolerate. For example, if there were just two of you sitting at desks in the room and I threw tennis balls at you one after the other after the other, you too might be able to handle transporting them into the basket next to you. However, if I started throwing the tennis balls at a much faster rate, or I had a machine that could start lobbing them at you really, really fast, then at a certain point, you would not be able to keep up with the rate of tennis balls. Essentially, my tennis ball catchers and putters in the basket would be saturated. So if there's only a limited number of receptors, they can only transport a limited number of molecules. So if there's only a limited number of transporters or carrier proteins, they can only take care of a limited number of molecules at a time. The more transporters they are, the higher the rate of transport across the membrane. So let's take a quick look at this animation. It should help us clear up our understanding of passive transport. The plasma membrane is the gatekeeper of the cell, allowing certain substances in and out of the cell at certain times in certain amounts. Diffusion is a process in which substances move across a membrane from an area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration, or between areas of opposite electrical charges. This is called the electrochemical gradient. Small, non-charged particles, primarily gases such as oxygen and carbon dioxide, can diffuse through the plasma membrane by moving in between the phospholipids in the bilayer. However, the cell needs to control what enters and leaves, and so transport proteins aid in the selective movement of other molecules across the membrane without the input of energy. Through facilitated diffusion, larger molecules, polar molecules, and charged ions use channel proteins embedded in the bilayer. The transport of other substances requires a special carrier that will bind the substance on one side of the membrane, which triggers a conformation change in the protein carrier, causing it to release the substance on the other side. When the molecule being transported across the membrane is water, diffusion is termed osmosis. The cytoplasm of the cell is an aqueous solution. Water is the solvent, and there are plenty of dissolved substances that are called solutes floating around in it. Osmosis is the net diffusion of water across a membrane towards a higher solute concentration. So it seems to be opposite of diffusion, but you have to think that osmosis is simply the diffusion of water. So if we look at this figure here, so if we look at the figure to the right, we can see that there are many solutes in this aqueous solution. If you're thinking about movement of the solutes, which way would the solutes go? Well, yes, naturally they'd go this way. However, the membrane may not be permeable to these solutes, and so we have a little bit of an issue because those solutes cannot move 
to come to a state of equilibrium with those on the other side. In the case of our biological membranes, water can move through the membrane. So water will move instead of the solutes in order to make things equal, because the natural state of things is to want to make things equal. So in order to dilute the substances over here on the left side of this U-tube, water will move across the semipermeable membrane from the right into the left side. So osmosis, again, is the diffusion of water across a membrane, usually when the solutes themselves cannot pass through the membrane. So the next thing we need to consider is how we describe these variations in concentration of solutes. When two solutions have a different osmotic concentration, one will be hypertonic and one will be hypotonic. We could replace these words with hyperosmotic and hypoosmotic. So it has hypertonicity, meaning there is more stuff in it. So the hypertonic solution has a higher solute concentration than the hypo, meaning lower, concentration of solutes. When two solutions have the same concentration, or osmotic pressure, they're called isotonic. They have the same tone, or the same amount of stuff in them. Now, in the case of osmosis, you might think, well, water, didn't we describe it as a polar molecule? Then how come it can cross through the hydrophobic center of that phospholipid bilayer? The secret to this is in aquaporins. Aquaporins are small protein channels that allow the passage of water through the membrane. When we look at the solutions down here, let's take a moment to think about whether things are hypertonic or hypotonic. When we look at this figure here, is this side hypertonic to this side? Or is it hypotonic to this side in the yellow? It is hypotonic. On the right-hand side, in the yellow area, however, though, is hypertonic to the solution in the blue side. Now, these figures represent inside and outside of the cell. So the inside of the cell, in this case, is hypotonic to the outside of the cell. But the outside of the cell is hypertonic relative to the inside of the cell. So these terms, you have to keep in mind, are relative. You cannot really use one without referring to the other. At least, that's the way I stay safe. In B, in the middle here, we have isotonic solutions. The outside of the cell, illustrated by yellow, is isotonic to the inside of the cell, illustrated in blue. In this case, over here, which side is hypotonic? Well, the yellow is hypotonic when we consider the blue, but if we didn't have to look, but if we didn't have the blue to look at, then we wouldn't have any reference point. The blue side is definitely hypertonic, to what we see in the yellow on the right side. Spend some time thinking about this and always keep those terms relative to one another. We'll talk about hypertonic and hypotonic relative to the cells coming up here shortly. So what is osmotic pressure then? We can come to an answer here when we consider the amount of water that enters a cell depends on the difference in solute concentration between the cell and the extracellular fluid. So, if you have a lot of solutes inside the cell and not a lot of solutes outside the cell, let's say when you put something in a freshwater bath, then the water is going to move into whatever it is you placed in there. And thus, we will generate a pressure inside the cell. So a cell in a hypotonic solution, like let's say we put a blood cell in fresh water, will gain water. This will cause it to swell and generate pressure. When we consider animal cells, the cell membranes can't tolerate this pressure and they will burst. However, when we put a cell in a hypertonic solution, 
the water from the cell will try to move out into the extracellular fluid and dilute the surrounding hypertonic solution. And thus, the cells will shrink. And if we have cells in an isotomic solution, just like we normally should, then the solution inside the cell has the same tonicity as the solution outside of the cell. And you'll have equal water movement in and out of the cell, so no net water movement and the cells will be normal. If the membrane is strong enough, a cell reaches a counterbalance of osmotic pressure, which is driving water into the cell, and hydrostatic pressure driving water out. So imagine this, we have a cell in a hypotonic solution. Water is moving from the surrounding solution into the cell to try and dilute the contents of the cell. But if the membrane is strong enough, now you have a pressure inside the cell that's actually pushing water out. This is how many of our filtration systems work. The cell wall of prokaryotes, fungi, plants, and protists allows for this type of balance where we see osmotic pressure pushing water in and hydrostatic pressure driving water out. The cells don't burst because of the cell wall. However, if the cell membrane is not strong enough or there is no cell wall, the cells may burst, just like we have seen with red blood cells in an isotonic environment. How do we maintain this osmotic balance? Obviously, it's very important to the integrity of our cells. Some cells, like protists, use extrusion in which water is ejected through a contractile vacuole. So as water moves into the cell continuously, let's say it's a freshwater protist, and so water's moving in to try and dilute the concentration of this cell, but it has a vacuole that fills up with water and squirts out through a little hole in the side. So this contractile vacuole is working to continually pump water out of the organism. Other organisms have to deal with isomotic regulation, that is keeping cells in isotonic water with their environment. Think of a marine organism. They have to adjust their internal cellular concentrations to match that of seawater. Otherwise, they would continually be losing water from their cells out into the ocean because the ocean is hypertonic to the environment inside the cells. For terrestrial organisms like ourselves, we've adjusted our circulating fluids to be isotonic with the cells in our body so that we can maintain our osmotic balance. Plants use turgor pressure to push the cell membrane against the cell wall and keep the cell rigid. The roots of land plants are surrounded by hypotonic solution. So water should be constantly moving into those cells through osmotic pressure. So the cell should fill up and it could even burst. But because plant cells have walls, the cell cannot swell and burst. And so it's actually this pressure that keeps the cell walls filled up and rigid and allows a plant to stand against gravity. Now what happens to a plant if you get too much solute in its water, like say by overwatering, and you've seen the white lines that form around the ceramic pots? Then the plant is bathed in hypertonic solution. I bet many of us have killed houseplants in that way. So let's take a moment now to move on and look at an animation of osmosis to help us firm up our understanding there. When the substance being moved across the membrane is water, the process is called osmosis. The cytoplasm of the cell, as well as the interstitial fluid, is composed of solutions. The solvent, usually water, moves across a semi-permeable membrane toward a higher solute concentration, consisting of various molecules or ions, until equilibrium of the solutions is reached. The plasma membrane contains proteins called aquaporins, which are specialized channels for the movement of water during osmosis.
A cell in a hypertonic environment will have water move from the inside of the cell toward the higher concentration of solutes in the solution outside the cell. In a hypotonic solution, the concentration of solutes is higher inside the cell than the outside environment, so water will diffuse into the cell. When the solutions on either side of the membrane reach equilibrium, they are referred to as isotonic. So let's take a quick card quiz to finish off this section of lecture. What does permeability refer to? You may want to pause for a moment and consider the answers. The movement of molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration is... A cell is placed in an hypotonic solution. Which way will the water move? If a blood cell, which has 0.9% sodium chloride, shrivels, what type of solution could it have been placed in? Think about which one would be hypo or hyper to cause it to shrivel. Here are your card quiz answers. If you got them all correct, you're good to go. Move on to the next section. But if not, generate some inquiry and figure out why. What information are you missing? Send an email or post to a discussion area.